I'm continuing on what we, we touched on last week. Um, the heart of the fathers to the sons. And in this regard, we are not talking about fathers and sons as in male species. We're talking about parenting, fathers as in parenting. So even if you're a mom, you are included in that, and sons as being the offspring, not necessarily the boy child. So the heart of the fathers to the sons. I sense in my heart that God is birthing amongst these people. I may talk about our church, I don't know about other places. A resurgence, a coming back, a, uh, a healing in the family as a unit. And not only in the family, but a, a restoration of a broken relationship, either between parents and children or us and God. That relationship is what God values. We looked at this extensively, not extensively, to a, to a large extent last Sunday, and I'm going to look at it again this week with you, and that we can try to understand God's heart. He, he, I don't think he takes pleasure, I don't think he takes pleasure where there's chaos. So when, when families are reunited, when hearts are reconnected, when relationships are restored, when that first love is picked up again, that's what brings pleasure to God. Amen? So we're talking about turning the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the heart of the sons to the fathers because it's reciprocal, this thing. You can't expect one without the other. You have to, to understand that this reaching out comes from both ways, and God is restoring this. And <laughs> I have a wild dream. Uh, I know that Sage is not here. Please remind me over the week. I have a really wild dream. Dr oh, is it a dream? Yes. That at some point before the end of this year, we're going to do this thing a little bit symbolically where fathers are going to take their sons out to a camp and just spend time with the sons. We will wait for those who are at varsity and so on to come back uh, that you can take your sons. Uh, I think the mothers can see how they do. Maybe you have scones here and... Uh, and muffins with your daughters. I'm not a mother. I don't know the motherly thing. But uh, we want to take our sons, um, including those who have no parents around, around. We are here for you. We will take our sons out on a camp. Now, I know there are men who have never slept under the moonlight. I'm not going to go to the house. Assure him he won't die. <laughs> We're all going to be there to protect him. That is now the big baby, your husband. Okay. So we will talk about that, but I'm, I'm looking forward to this because it's very serious to God where fathers can reconnect with their sons and sons reconnect with their fathers. All right. <clears throat> When we talk about the heart, we all know this, but allow me to say it. If you look at the Bible dictionary, this is what it means, the heart. It says it, it's considered to be the seat of life or strength. The heart is considered to be the seat of life and strength. In other words, the very life that you and I live is seated in our heart, not the physical organ that pumps blood. It goes beyond that. So it is considered to be the seed of life or strength. In other words, the resolve to do things comes from that portion of, of who you are called your heart. Um, <clears throat> there is an old song. I don't know. We, we, what was the group that sang this song? My body is here with you, <laughs> but my mind is on the other side of town. You remember that? Okay. Yes. 
Uh, what, okay, the OJs, the Temptations. Uh, Pastor Nomsa's favorite group. All right. It also means, okay, now that we have kind of explained what we, we mean by the heart in this context, we are saying God is restoring the seat of life and strength from the fathers towards their, their, their sons and the sons towards their fathers. There is this magnet that's coming up where your whole being is drawn towards and your whole being is willing to give the other. Hence it means, that's the second point, mind, when we talk about the mind, we are talking about the heart. It means mind, soul, spirit, or one's entire emotional nature and understanding. Can we read that together? Hence, it means the mind. When the Bible talks about the mind, it talks about this. The soul, the spirit, or one's entire emotional nature and understanding. I, I, I'm, I'm zooming a little bit more this morning on the, on the part of the emotional nature. Um, that, that's where I want to focus on. When we say God is restoring the hearts, we are saying he's, he's stirring up the emotional, na the emotional being, the emotional you, the emotional me towards the sons and towards the fathers. In other words, it will not just be head, a head exercise, a mental exercise rather, but it is going to be also an emotional exercise. How many of you have ever fallen in love? Can I see your, both your hands? I boy, young people. Nani? All right. I see some short hands, they're going. <laughs> nah, I'm only joking. <laughs> All right. Can I see those hands again you have ever, if you have ever fallen in love? <laughs> yeah, my daughter, my daughter. Yeah, uh, you, you brothers. I said, can I see both your hands if you've ever fallen in love? One guy goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy on men. <clears throat> All right. You know that when you have gotten to that phase, your whole body seems like is spinning out of sync, okay? You, you are a food lover, and all of a sudden you don't eat. The appetite is gone. Who can say Mfundis have been there? You, all of a sudden, you, you, you don't know why. Love is a beautiful thing. You know why? It's because it's seated in our emotional nature. Um, Okay, let me not go there. I just want to get carried away when I explain this thing of falling in love. But I refuse in the name of Jesus. <laughs> they say you lose your mind temporarily. I like that book I read. They say it's called, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's insanity. It's temporal. It says the problem is that the patient loves this insanity. They don't want to be delivered from this insanity. Okay? So we're talking about that when we talk about the heart restored. In other words, the same feeling, the same emotion that I just explained now, God is restoring that. He is restoring that. Our emotion towards him, our emotion towards one another, our emotion towards our offspring, 
and our parents. So we are talking about a place where deep love resides. Or it can also be deep resentment, depending on who is in charge here. If God is in charge, deep love resides there. But if Satan has come to distort things, deep hatred comes from there, which is why we hear of fathers pulling out a gun, shooting the wife, the children, and himself. We also see the same with the mothers. It's because once Satan puts his filthy hand on that seat, he distorts everything. The greatest battles that many people fight are not with enemies out there, they are with families within. They are ready to kill each other. They even kill each other. Because when Satan gets involved in there, he, he, he will twist things around so bad that the guy who mugs you on the streets, you will hate him less than the one you're supposed to love more. It's because Satan has twisted that. So it's where deep love resides. Okay, deep love. It can also be where deep resentment resides. And I'm not speaking here as somebody who knows the stuff, but I'm speaking from experience and also things that you observe. We had last week a heart where deep love resides towards their son. When we looked at how David pleaded with the men who were chasing after his son, Absalom, who wanted to kill David. He initiated this insurrection against his own father. It's deep resentment. But on the other hand, you see a father with deep love who pleads with these soldiers. He says, listen, when you, caught, when you catch up with my son and his army, please be kind to my child. In other words, in as much as legally we're supposed to to deal with him severely because of what he has done, because this was a, a serious crime uh, in the kingdom, that somebody could rise up against the king, and in this case it's the son. But the king says, in as much as I abide by the law, there is a deep thing in my heart that says, please, when you find my son, be gentle towards him. Amen? So, we see this everywhere in the scriptures. I want us to look at a few examples. I will try to rush through them by the help of the Lord. God, think about it, God never asked Abraham to give away or give up his great wealth to test how much he trusted and loved God. But God asked him to give up his son. Did you get that? God never asked him, Abraham, can you give up your livestock, everything? Give up everything so that I can test if you love me. Rather, God said, give up your son and let me see if you love me. We know the story in the book of Genesis chapter 22 that that morning Abraham took the boy after God said, go and sacrifice him. He went up the mountain with a boy carrying the firewood, the knife, the rope. And as they got up there to make fire, the son asked the father, Dad, I can see the altar that you are building, and I'm used to this. Every time you put up this altar, there's always a lamb that will be sacrificed. But today I don't see the lamb. Where is the lamb? And the father says, my boy, God will see for himself. And having said that, he tied up his son. He put him on the altar. He pulls out the knife. Can you see the level of trust here? The boy asked, Father, where is the lamb? And Father said, God will fend for himself. From that moment on, the boy knew, I am not the lamb. Because he could have revolted. He could have jumped up and down and said, Dad, what are you doing? But he trusted him so much. And the father 
spoke out of a deep personal conviction that this God can be trusted. He gave me this gift. He can't take it away from me. So once he put up the sun on that thing, on that uh, altar, look at verse 12. Then the Lord said, do not reach out with a knife in your hand against the boy and do nothing to harm him. For now, for now I know that you fear God with reverence and profound respect. Until now, I know that you love me. Why? Since you have not withheld from me your son, your only son of promise. This man was so much in love with God that he said, if it means I sacrifice my boy, I will do that. But on the other hand, I mean, it would have been easy to sacrifice. I mean, these guys, they sacrificed animals like you cannot believe in their time. Go read the Bible. Think about it. When they celebrate, they would slaughter a thousand cattle. Who has ever seen a thousand cattle in a field? I've never seen them. I've only seen 300, and we say, wow. Think about a thousand. And they would slaughter these in a day. So killing animals was no big deal for them. But your son. This is where God needs to heal a lot of us. I grew up, I'm an African just like you. <laughs> we know what witchcraft does. We're fathers, mothers, for their quest of wealth and riches, would be asked to, to sacrifice their own children just to get money. We know that. Maybe you are from that kind of a family which left you asking, does my father really love me? If he could even contemplate the idea of laying me on the altar just to gain wealth. That's what I'm saying when I say God is restoring and healing. Because there's a lot of forgiveness that needs to come up here. I know fathers who, when they fight with the mother, they hate the mother and hate the children. Um, God is healing this. God is restoring this. Those kids are left confused. They don't know who else to tend to. They grow up without hurt. But today I'm trusting God that that will be restored. It will be healed. I grew up in a home where my dad divorced and he remarried. And how we saw, <laughs> I've never, <laughs> growing up, we, my dad never took us to the beach from the first wife. <laughs> we were small. And we would hear through a grapevine that somebody saw them in the beach somewhere. They were so happy. <laughs> now, nah, but from the second wife. And guess what it would do to you? You would think, hey, my God. Can't he? Utara, he knows where the beach is. <laughs> I, I thought he doesn't even know there's a beach. And you hear this and you are like, yeah. God needs to heal that very thing I'm talking about. There is no room for resentment. He is restoring things. Now you might say, Pastor, it's easier said than done. That's why we need Jesus to help us. Hallelujah. We need him to help us. So I'm talking here about deep-rooted love. He can exchange that resentment for this kind of love. He can give it to you. I mean, he can give it to you. He can. From that to the other extreme end. Here is a story in the Bible. We all know it, but let's read it. It will, yeah, it will do something 
talking about deep-rooted love. First Kings chapter 3, I want us to look at verse 16. I will go through very fast. Verse 16 reads as follows. One day, two prostitutes came and presented themselves before King Solomon. One of them said, listen to this, Your Majesty, this woman I live in the same house. Oh, sorry, this woman and I live in the same house. And I gave birth to a baby boy at home while she was there. Two days after my child was born, she also gave birth to a baby boy. Only the two of us were there in the house. No one else was present. Then one night, she accidentally rolled over on her baby and smoothed it. In other words, killed the baby. She got up during the night, took my son from my side while I was asleep, carried him to her bed. Then she put the dead child in my bed. The next morning when I woke up and was going to nurse my baby, I saw that it was dead. I looked at it more closely and I saw that it, this was not my child. But the other woman said, no, the living child is mine and the dead one is yours. The first woman answered back, no, the dead child is yours and the living one is mine. And so they argued before the king. Then King Solomon said, each of you claims that the living child is hers and that the dead child belongs to the other one. He sent for a sword and it was brought to him. He said, cut the living child in two and give each woman half of it. The verse 26 was in the song, the real mother, her heart full of love for her son, said to the king, please, your majesty, don't kill the child. Give it to her. But the other woman said, don't give it to either of us. Go on and cut it in two. Then Solomon said, don't kill the child. Give it to the first woman. She is its real mother. We're talking about deep love. The real mother said, I can't watch my babies being slaughtered just to settle scores. Give my baby to this criminal here. I would rather watch my child growing up from a distance than to see my child slaughtered. We're talking about deep love. I said last week, parents, don't use your children as pawns when you fight over your divorces and stuff. Think about your kids first. I'll never forget the first time I heard this. It was from Felicia Mabuza Sattel. It shocked me out of my socks because I never thought that people would think like this. She, she was hosting her show back then, and she said, girl, if this marriage doesn't work for you, get out of it. Stop this nonsense where you say, I'm always thinking about my children. It's about you. Ah, I couldn't believe this. It, it, it shocked me so bad that can a woman, a mother, for that, for that regard, even think of what she just said? That if it means it's going to compromise my good feelings, caring about my children. Give up those kids, man, who cares? As long as you're going to feel good. And do you know that is permeating throughout our society today? Maybe what messed me up was my mom, who, while she was deserted and left by her husband, my dad, would cry every day and say, had it not been for my children, I would have left a long time ago. I thought all mothers think that way. <laughs> I didn't know that there are mothers who say, if it's going to mess up with my good time, was born in God is restoring this. Some of us have bought that lie, and we believe it. You are sitting here today. You're sitting here because that's what you've done. You've turned your back and walked away from your children, emotionally and otherwise. But pastor, if I could have stayed in that marriage, you would have killed me. I'm not talking about the monster you were married to. I'm talking about your children. 
bantwana bakho talk about your children whatever he does to me but if it's going to affect my children i'm ready to put up my clothes like a mother bear and say not my kids not my kids even if it means i sacrifice my own feelings and my own well-being i'm not going to do this to my children i asked last sunday let there be no father sitting here with a new wife <laughs> and you think this is your whole world when you know you've got kids out there who are not being cared for and here you lift in holy hands dance before the itinango i will dance in your presence till you come and you've got kids who are cursing you every day because you've sacrificed them for a good time may god help us in this as he restores some of you are, are, are from such perfect families you are lost what is he talking about you hypocrite show me one perfect family give me that family you think is perfect and allow us to dig deeper in there you will be shocked the skeletons that are, hi are hiding there you actors <laughs> so this affects every person sitting here in one way or the other think about the mother the wife <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a joke it's not in the bible that one i know that i'm talking to christians here um no we kill it by believing now live this now, the story is told that this guy comes back from town and he says to his wife, Ah, oh, sweetie, guess who I met in town? Mom. She says, oh, really? And he says, oh, she was so desperate for money. And I gave her, I went to the bank and I withdrew the 5,000 and I gave it to her. Oh, she lost it. How can you do this? You know that we deal. How can you do this? And he says, but sweetie, she needed the money. She said, 5,000 rand? Are you crazy? How can you give your mother 5,000 rand? He says, no, it was not my mother, your mother. She says, oh, no, only 5,000. Oh, oh, poor mom. Oh, it's Aram. Only five. Oh, you should have called me. Oh, listen. <laughs> you hate his mother for whatever reason. God is restoring this. God is restoring this. What's worse, she gave birth to this sweet, cute little teddy bear with hair on his face. You enjoy rubbing this hair on the face. Yeah, Is that woman who gave birth to this thing? When I'm with you, sweetie, my whole world is complete. Hey! I said, I refuse. <laughs> so I'm trusting God that this restoration, and by the way, it's not Pastor Don's thoughts. I feel this in my heart. That is what the Holy Spirit is doing here. I'll, I'll close with that verse we started with last week so that we see how serious God takes this. Amen? Deep love. It cannot only be with the fathers. You'll also find it with the children, where God heals them. Let's go to this pro prominent story, Luke chapter 15. And let's look at verses 11 to 24 quickly. Then Jesus said, once there was a father with two sons, the younger son came to his father and said, Father, 
Don't you think it's time to give me my share of your estate? So the father went ahead and distributed between the two sons their inheritance. I'll never forget the day where my boys at the time <laughs> would, would prepare for our holidays, not December. We would always look forward to that. I remember when they were <laughs> young, <laughs> uh, we were in a city where there was a beach. And I would take them to the beach. <laughs> uh, my wife, she doesn't like the beach. In fact, she hates sand on her feet. She can't imagine walking on sand. Jeez. So we would leave her in the flat and I'd go with the boys. And we, we just got there. And I'm like sitting there thinking, oh, let me just relax. <laughs> And here they walk out of the water crying, the two guys. The other one with the bass, the other with the tenor. Uh, you can guess who had the bass. Uh, uh. I said, hey, what's wrong with you? Uh, uh. I said, listen, there is the flood. Go to your mother. I'm born up. They went. <laughs> they walked into the, through the lift, but Get to the flood. Uh, uh, and Nomsa says, what happened? She said, hey, bulldogs, man. Meanwhile, it's blue bottles. You're landing on the hey, bulldogs, what did you do? And where was me? <laughs> so we enjoyed those times with them came a day when I said to them, boys, guess what? I've booked and paid for our flat for December. And the, the one with the base, hey, sorry, Dada, no, we're not coming with you. We've spoken to our friends, we're going to Cape Town. <laughs> hey, I went into a mini depression. <laughs> I'm like, what? Are you sacrificing? Time with this dude. <laughs> and they said, no, as a matter of fact, we're leaving tomorrow. I was so hurt and depressed. Mini depression. Because of this, I'm thinking, what have I done to these boys? How can they choose them over me? But about three, four years ago, I said to Sweetie, <laughs> the time is here because we now have an empty nest, the two of us, where there will be no Christmas dinners and lunches. She didn't hear me until Christmas came. <laughs> it was the two of us in Pots and Johns. She, she wakes up on the Christmas morning. I'm thinking, I'm going to say, Happy Christmas. She, <laughs> and I'm thinking, Oh God, the Christmas. What now? Oh. <laughs> she says, I, I don't like this. I don't like. I think, What have I done? I didn't say anymore. I don't like this. My kids did it. Whoa, it doesn't end there. She, I've got pictures on the phone. She laid out, we've got a very long table there. She said, I'm going ahead, preparing lunch for Christmas. <laughs> laid out the whole table, plates and everything. I'm watching, so I'm helping, but I can't laugh. Laid out the thing. She cooked a storm. She dished for the two of us, but she brought everything. She says, the devil is a liar. <laughs> I'm thinking, who can I invite for Christmas lunch? I can't finish this food. <laughs> Think about the father whose son came to him and said, Dad, 
What you are give, going to give or leave for me when you die, bring it here now. How did he feel? That's the point I'm making. How did he feel? Verse 13 says, shortly afterward, the younger son packed up all his belongings. The father is watching. And he traveled off to see the world. You know, when we had this ICHE here, the one father, um, let me not mention the name, he was here with his son. And <laughs> he introduces me to his boy uh, from the U.S. And then he says this. You can't take this away from fathers. He says, my son is so independent, but the drop on his face. He says, he's lived in this country and in that country. He says, he, my son, you know, he says, I'm so blessed he decided to come here with me. Not that there was a fight, but that's the boy. And they were here for a day. The following day, I hear that, no, the son, they are going to drop him at the airport. He's leaving his father here. He's flying to Cape Town. <laughs> so as they were leaving, I say to him, okay, at the airport to see them. Off. I say, are you going to meet your son at, in Joburg? He says, hopefully. Can you see deep love? So the guy says, listen, dad, let me just go see the world. He journeyed to a far off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant and reckless living. Verse 14, with everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry because there was a severe famine in the land. So he begged a farmer in that country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. The son was so famished, he was willing to even eat the slop given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. Humiliated. Everybody say humiliated. humiliated. The son finally realized what he was doing. And he thought, there are many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I dying of hunger feeding these pigs and eating their slop? Verse 18, I want to go back home to my father's house and I will say to him, Father, I was wrong. I've sinned against you. Listen to me. Fat sons always come back home. I want you to hear this. Through sons, Paul is talking to them, writing to Timothy. He says, Timothy, my true son. Because there are others who are not true sons, though they call themselves sons. But true sons with this specific DNA can go off, betray the father, the mother, betray the family, do all the silly things. But true sons, they always come back home. They can all leave 15 of them, but out of the 15, the true sons who are carrying this DNA will not come with conditions when they come back home. They will say to themselves, I can't live like this when in my father's house there is more than we need. Think about it. Imagine when you're kid who has gone off tracks and decides to come back home and they say, we only, I'm only coming back home on this condition. Are you going to take them back? No. Because their heart is not here. In a context like the church, <laughs> you easily pick up through sons, and again, not in gender, please. You easily pick them up. They are not the type that even if they've messed up, can rejoice over this. True sons know. There is a verse I just deleted here because of time. I don't know if we'll have time to look at this. The floods were over. 
and they went, got off the, 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 the boat back into their life. It says Noah started a new hobby, farming, grew up a vineyard, learned how to make wine, the fermented type. He drank it so excessively that he got so drunk, he took off his clothes. I think it's him, the son, if I'm not mistaken. He saw his father's nakedness. He ran outside to his two brothers. He's laughing. He says, you haven't seen this. Come check it time up and apart. He is so drunk, he's walking around naked. The two sons, they took that sheet, held it one on each corner, walked in reverse towards their father to cover his nakedness. True sons will never rejoice even when the father goes through hell. Never. True sons. Not cheap talk. There is this thing we call DNA. That's what sets you apart and make you unique. This guy is an example of true sons. And as much as we see the father's heart, we also need to see the son's heart. Okay? So he says, I'll go back to my father. I'll say to him, I've sinned against you. He won't say, I'll go back to my father and say, when they were gossiping about you, I was, but it was not me. It was like, you know, I was caught up in the moment. Uh-uh. He says, me. I've betrayed you. Okay? Verse 19. I will never again be worthy to be called your son because I know what I've done. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the young son set off for home from a long distance away. His father saw him coming. You know what that tells me? I can just imagine that every morning this father was looking at the horizon, saying, one day my boy is coming back home. One day. He saw him from a horizon, long distance away, dressed as a beggar. And what happens? Great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. The father could not every wrong that the boy has done. This deep-seated love covered all that up. Covered it up. He never said, I worked so hard for my money. I worked so hard. I thought when they, no, no, no. He said, listen, listen. This is my boy. So what did the father do? A lot of us miss that. He raced out. He ran to meet his son. He never stood there and said, now nah, let me watch this rascal coming back. No. He ran to meet his son. He swept him up in his arms he hugged him dearly and kissed him over and over with what? Tender love. Then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I've sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be. The father interrupted him and said, Hey, son, you are now home. You are now home. Turning to his servant, the father said, quickly, bring me the best robe, my very own robe. You just gave him his inheritance. Father said, all of that is covered in my love for this boy. Give him my own robe, and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship. I will put it on his finger, and bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. 
Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For my beloved son was once dead, but now he's alive. He was once lost, but now he is found. And everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. Please listen. God is restoring these hearts, even in our time. May you never be the stumbling block there. I don't care what your rationale is. May God's grace supersede that. Where there is hatred and resentment, may God heal. And you, Father, sitting here, and you've deserted your children because you hate their mother. May God deal with your heart so severely that you will go back and apologize to those kids. The parents who fight between the, in front of their kids, calling each other names instead of providing security. You need to call those kids and sit down with them and apologize. Be a man enough to tell them, I was foolish when I did this. You know, as I told the story once, this boy is now grown up here at our school. I saw him every other day. He's sitting there when they're going home. He's like so depressed, a chubby boy. And I called him in my office one day. I asked him, you don't look fine every time I watch you through my window. And the boy says, Pastor, you know, very shy. He says, when it's time to go home, my heart feels so sore. I asked why. He says, every time my mom and dad fight, dad says, I will kill you. The boy says, I'm scared to get home one day and find my mother dead, killed by my father. Think about this. Grow up and stop your selfishness. You are so full of yourself. I'm right, Pastor. My, the wife was wrong. Listen, go make right with your kids. No, what if, what if? You still have a reputation. What reputation? You've lost it. The day your kids lost respect for you, you've lost all forms of reputation. The world can praise you. The world can dance for you. But if your children can't, it means nothing. Absolutely nothing. No, oh, but I pay for their school fees. You are not an ATM. You are a father with emotions. Only God can heal this. <laughs> Mom, you hate this firstborn of yours because every time you look at him, he looks so much like... <laughs> you, you need healing. I'm serious. You can't put it out on the child. And the child knows this. Have you seen that funny video of the parents, is it parents or one parent coming back home, parents coming back home after a holiday, they left their kids there with the grandmom, small kids. And they get off the car and the kids come running. They come running, yeah, small ones. And mom is all smiles, their arms are open. And the young king runs past her mother to go and hug dad. And mom is like, listen, you are reaping what you have been sowing here. You can manipulate. I'm your mother. I'm your mother. <laughs> listen, have you sown in mother's seeds? Because if you have not, when they think parent, they don't think you. They think dead. But you can also restore this by having a very frank talk with your kids and say, man, my fight with your father, I lived it out on you guys. I'm sorry. We are in that season where God is birthing this thing. Here is the closing verse. The promise 
that God has given. And that which Satan is messing up. Malachi chapter 4, we read it last week. Let me read again. He says, look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, otherwise, if it doesn't happen, I will come and strike the land with a curse. We're going to see families breaking through these deadlocks that you cannot explain. You try this, it doesn't work. You try that, it doesn't work. We're going to see this breaking when the restoration happens. You thought it's the demon that was killed by your enemy and buried in your garden or whatever. All these scary things. No, it's you in your heart. If you are not going to restore these relationships, you're not going to heal that you can be what God called you to be, a true son, a true daughter, a father, a mother, you're still going to continue with those deadlocks, blockages. I don't care how much money you make. <laughs> it's not about that. You are lonely. You are lonely. You are even guilty. You live condemned every day. Even this message is shaking you to the core because you know you have not been what God has called you to be. I believe God for restoration here. Where we're going to flourish in the true sense of the word. You're sleeping around with every other man because you are empty. In your age, in your age, I'm not talking teenagers, I'm talking mature people, is because you yourself are empty. You need to restore and rebuild these broken walls. Bandwanabam, you are still very young. You have your life ahead of you. Get out of bitterness. Get out of bitterness. Get out of it. If your father is that idiot who just dropped you, dumped you like that, let that idiocracy not reside on you. Get out of it. In your heart says, Father, I forgive this guy. I forgive him. Not that I'm going run to run around after him or what. No, no, no. I'm setting myself free here. I'm not going to carry this anger. Because it's not killing him, it's killing me. You've got your life ahead of you. Let us pray. Every head bowed, please, and every eye closed. I will not tire from giving you an opportunity to make right. The altar is for that. If you are here today with your head bowed and your eye closed, there is a relationship that you want to restore. Maybe it's between you and God. You know that there is a distance. There is a schism that has grown and developed bef between you and God, a gap your heart is getting very cold towards God. He wants to restore this heart that you will love him with your life and your strength. And I pray with you. If that's you, can you raise up your hand and say, Pastor Ron, please pray with me. We are bound up on Koyo. Raise it up high. Don't be shy. Say, Pastor, that's me. Pray with me. I've never given Jesus my life. I've never known this friendship. I've never felt this, this warmth, this love, this embracing. That's why my future is so scary. It's because when I look at my future, there's just no hope. My friend, I, I can ask you now. He wants to restore you. He wants you to be his child. He wants that heart to be drawn to him. Just raise up your hand if you haven't done that yet. As in Fundisi, that's me. Please pray with me. It's no shame. It's not an embarrassment. We understand this is the relationship that the devil will focus on to destroy you. But Jesus wants to heal. Who else says, Fundisi, that's me. Raise up your hand. Don't be shy. If you haven't raised it up yet, 
We want to make right with God. We want this relationship back on track. Or for the first time in your life, my friend, today you are going to jump in there and say, Lord Jesus, here's my life. Here is my life. Here is who I am. Here is my mess. Now let's close our arms, cause the list is a good one. I'm trying. The list is a good way to go. I'm not trying to say now. It's pants on, pants off. Living as per me, so them phones them here. Now let's close our arms. I want you to help me here. The church, we are praying for you. We understand what's happening. The devil is a liar. Let Jesus win today, and let the devil lose. Let Jesus win today and let the devil lose. Secondly, as these that I'm asking are raising up their hands and we're going to pray with them, there is a second group that I want to pray with. It's those of us who say, I need this healing in my life for my sake. These relationships have hurt me so bad that I've even said things that I'm not proud of, out of anger, bitterness and resentment. I'm asking God today to exchange that and put in there in my emotional nature deep love. Only God can do that. I want to pray with you. If you are here, I don't care whether you are anything in the church, but you know in your heart there is this part of me that needs to be restored. I want you to raise up your hand and say, Mfundisi, that's me. Please pray with me. And I pray with you because I do believe God is birthing something new here. God is birthing something new. He's killing all hypocrisy. He's destroying all hypocrisy. God is birthing something new here. In the name of Jesus Christ, I want to pray with you. Please come. Come. As we sing this song, I'm waiting on you. Let's come. Uta, for you in our hearts we don't feel repelled from you but drawn even more because of how much you care for us father only you can do this in our hearts and in our lives only you nobody else can you said you will restore the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons hearts to the fathers and lift up the curse. You will lift up the curse. 
We don't want to live under this heavy cloud of guilt and condemnation in our lives. We want to live under the blessing that Jesus has brought for us. We don't want this cloud in our thinking, in our minds. We don't want it anywhere close to us. We want to know in every facet of our lives, we are blessed. And Lord, you say, when these hearts are restored, when these hearts are restored, when our wrongdoing is forgiven, Lord, you're going to bring back Oh God, Jesus, just pray in the spirit, please. Oh God, heal, heal your people, Father. Heal your people, Lord, heal. Heal your people, Father, I pray. Heal your people, Father, I pray. Restore what the locusts have devoured. Restore. Restore, Father. Restore, restore, restore. Restore, Lord. Restore, Father. We are asking you, restore, Lord. Pilisa, take away to Pilisa, Pilisa, Pilisa. We are releasing that forgiveness. 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 We are setting ourselves. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Oh God. Jesus. 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 At the mention of your name, Father, even the desert will change. At the mention of your name, the drought will lift up. At the mention of your name, the, la the lack will go. At the mention of your name, heaviness lifts up at the mention of your name. At the mention of your name, guilt goes. It lifts up at the mention of your name. Sweet Jesus. Sweet Jesus, this is who you are, Lord. This is who you are. You are the lover of our soul. You are the one who sets us free. You are the one who heals us and restores us. Even from our past, you are healing us even this morning. You are healing us. You are healing our past. 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 Some of these children, when they hear the good news, will even be set free from these addictions. Because this is what they've been crying for. They will come back home, Father. Our homes will be havens of peace once again. Our homes will be havens of peace once again. As you restore, Spirit of God, as you restore, as you heal, we won't interfere with you. We won't interfere. You are doing it the way you know, which is the best way. Heal the wounds. Heal the mind that is oppressed by this anger. Heal it as the anger evaporates. Heal, Father, I pray. In the name of Jesus. 
And as much as we can't reverse our words, but we can put new words in place. Singa teta mazwama cha no kazi ngena wa kuchli sa esa wa teta singa jali mbewe nchangogo new seed that we are planting with our words to nurture these relationships to nurture these relationships oh sweet jesus sweet jesus sweet jesus sweet jesus sweet jesus they call you the rose of sharon lord the lily of the valley you are the bright and the morning star Sweet Jesus, Emmanuel, God, who always stays with us. Embrace your people, Father, as they come to you. Embrace them, Father. Embrace them, Father. Embrace them and heal them. Heal them, Lord. Heal them. Heal them, we pray. Heal us, we pray. Heal us. Now, Lord, whatever work you are doing in these hearts, we say seal it, cover it. Let not the birds of the air come and steal. No, they will not come and steal. Fathers are going to be fathers again and get out of their, their high horses of emotional superiority, which is so useless. Fathers are going to come back and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am sorry. Fathers are coming back to say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Amen. Just listen to this, please. I, I do believe some of you, <laughs> you are not just going through this. You are taking this thing seriously. I do believe that. Let me say this as I hear the Holy Spirit saying to me, it's not going to be easy the first time out, but don't quit. You might be rejected as you come, but don't quit. You have to go back there consistently and say, I'm sorry. You don't go back and say, I'm sorry, and, they don't ref and you walk away. No, no, no. You go back and say, I'm sorry. And God is going to heal this. I do believe it is all of my heart that before the end of this year, we're going to hear beautiful stories. Beautiful stories. As a matter of fact, I was so encouraged last week after the men's cells where I got messages from men saying, yo, something broke in our home cell when as men we were reflecting on this message. And I'm trusting God that that will continue to happen. He will break the hard ground. The Holy Spirit will break the hard ground and make it pliable because we have to bear fruit for the glory of God. I would imagine the same maybe in the, in the ladies' cells because that, this doesn't choose male or, gen or female. No, it's affecting all of us. Amen? And those of you who need someone to just agree with you in prayer, just follow Luazi as we do the song. Again, one more time, please. <laughs>